Welcome to the only source for information on the Boston Red Sox farm system on the web. This is the SoxProspects.com podcast, episode number 118. Thank you for the download or the stream. My name is Chris Hatfield. I'm the executive editor of SoxProspects.com. Coming to you from the Sox Prospects Mid-Atlantic offices here in our nation's capital, where they still haven't turned on the air conditioning, but at least it's cooled off outside, so it's less of an issue. Um, where there's a cat sleeping on my lap for the time being. Uh, so on behalf of Firefly, the honorary editor of the podcast, I'm joined by, what did we decide to call you last last episode, Ian? The, the Boy Wonder? What was it? Sidekick? Uh, host. Co-host. That isn't really the host. <laughs> Fair enough, something like that. Uh, but anyways, yes, the director of scouting, Ian Cundall. Uh, Ian, we're... we're Starting this new whole uh, scheduling thing, and i got to say I kind of like it. Uh, we're recording this on Saturday the 6th. It'll be released on April the 8th. Uh, I like this uh, whoa, schedule thing. Sorry, the cat just convulsed on me because she's having a dream. But. Yeah, it's nice. It's also nice that it isn't raining up here today, and they're actually oh. kind of playing baseball semi-close to me for the first yeah. time in like two weeks. <laughs> Excellent. Well, that's, yeah, well it, it, one person playing baseball, as we'll soon talk about, is Rafael Devers, and he's playing it very well. But, uh, uh, yeah, I would say so. Yeah, <laughs> it might no, be an understatement. <laughs> yeah. No, uh, no third wheel today. It's just going to be the two of us, and we're just going to focus this episode on answering your questions. We've got a bunch of email questions in the hopper, so thank you all for sending those in. We appreciate it. Uh, we'll be getting to those, and we'll be getting to the news. But first, some business. One way that you can support the podcast is to subscribe and rate and review really helps us out, helps us get in some new ears. We're on iTunes, we're on Stitcher, we're on Google Play Music, we're on YouTube. Subscribing is the easiest way for you to know when there's new episodes because they'll download automatically. Uh, so download, rate, and review. We'd appreciate that. You can also support us on patreon.com slash prospects. We are oh so close to our initial goal of $50 per episode. So help us reach that goal. You can donate a small amount per episode, $1, $2, $5, uh, $2, $2. Uh, not a lot of money. We're not asking for you know hundreds of thousands of dollars or anything here. You can see the rewards on Patreon, but it's some good stuff. And as always, we want to thank our $5 level contributors. That's Cody Pimentel, Sock Signatures, Lendell Martin, Kirby Miller, and Gerardo Ian Tosca. Um, we're going to be scheduling our quarterly chat with our $2 and up contributors very soon. Uh, I'm, I'm gone next weekend, but I think the weekend after that maybe might be a good time to do it or the week after. Um, or maybe during the week at some point, but we'll be in touch. We'll probably have to email with Mike about that, Ian. But uh, we'll be getting in touch about that. So if you're a $2 contributor, keep an eye out for that announcement. Uh, again, that's patreon.com slash Sox Prospects, P-A-T-R-E-O-N dot com slash Sox Prospects. We also want to thank the Love Those Thieves for our intro music, All the Money. Uh, you can check them out on iTunes, Amazon, Spotify, and however you listen to music. They've uh, actually got a new EP in the works. Uh, I've heard some of it, and it is uh, delightful. So, uh, yeah, go support them. They do some good stuff. Um, also, as I mentioned, we love getting your emails. So please send those to podcast at SoxProspects.com. We've got a bunch of them today. Uh, we're going to clear out the mailbag. We want to fill it back up. So email us there. Emailing us is a lot better way to get your question on the podcast than sending it in on Twitter. If you send us things on Twitter, there's a decent chance that it will get lost in the shuffle. So uh, email, best way to get into your questions. Again, that's podcast at SoxProspects.com. Uh, mentioning Twitter, you can follow the site's Twitter account at SoxProspects. I am at SP Chris Hatfield. You can follow Ian at Ian Cundall. Uh, that's C-U-N-D-A-L-L. Uh, so without further ado, Ian, let's get into the news. We're going to start hitting the news first thing on every episode of the show. And... Uh, Really no reason to wait to get into it, Ian. Uh, the, the way I have this written down is an interesting uh, comparison. Raphael Devers is on fire while Boston's third base situation is a dumpster fire. Let's start with the positives. Uh, Raphael Devers, he went deep again today. He's got five bombs in his last seven or something like that. That's correct. He's hitting the ball really well. What, 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 are, you, what are your thoughts on young Mr. Devers, who is now the top prospect in the system? He's, I mean, he's adjusting to double A. It seems, you know, he, he pretty quickly. And um, yep. yeah, I, 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 I mean, I, I'm not surprised, but at the same time, I thought it would take him a little longer to start kind of performing like this. 
because the jump up from high A to double A is pretty significant. Double A is the first time you're going to start seeing, you know, those organizational like 25, 26 year old Mm. pitchers Mm -hmm. who will just spin breaking balls and just can locate their fastball down in the zone. And um, Devers, you know, I saw him the first, I've seen him five times this year, I think. And he's, he was hitting the ball hard, but he wasn't, he wasn't, it, the results weren't there. Um, you know, he had, a, I think, one home run. I saw his first one of the year. And other than that, you know, it was a couple doubles, singles, but it wasn't, wasn't what he is doing right now, which obviously isn't going to continue. But it's more in line with what you expect with him because his bat is legit. I mean, he's going to hit for average. He's going to hit for power. And the interesting thing to me is that he's doing this while he's adjusting to getting shifted. And we saw last year with certain guys, example A being Josh Alchemy, that the shift can kind of get in your head and you can start trying to get out of what you're good at. And, you know, maybe you're starting to just try to hit the ball the other way when you're much better at pulling the ball or you're just, you know, you're hitting the ball hard, but it just happens to be right at a defender. And it seems like Devers is just, he doesn't phase him at all. You know, he's hitting opposite field home runs. He's grounding balls to the left, to the left side. He's hitting line drives to the right side. He's even bunting for hits. Like, he just seems to be really locked in right now. And, um, yeah, it's as we saw this over this past week, it sparked a lot of conversation in the Boston media about when is he going to be ready. So Yeah, I did a radio spot. I did a radio spot this week for a station up in Maine. And, you know, that was actually the second thing I got asked about because it was the day that Stephen Wright went on the DL and, uh, and Kyle Kendrick came up, which we'll talk about in a bit here, but uh, they asked about Devers being ready and we actually did get some questions about Devers. So maybe we should just get to those now. Um, The easiest one we did get from Twitter and it's from Nick at AA galaxy. And uh, he just asked really easy. Yes or no Devers plays the Red Sox this season, which is the very simple Twitter version of the question I got asked, which was basically that we've seen a lot is when he's going to be ready. I mean, I would say September is, I would I would definitely say a possibility. That's no question. I, the question is just how likely September is, and how likely anything before that is. I wouldn't bet on anything before that. It could happen, but it's just you know just because something happened with Xander Bogarts doesn't make it a thing that's likely to happen by any stretch. Uh, well, I don't I know. Th- what do you think? I think we've seen that more recently the Red Sox have been pretty aggressive with their promotions. Like Andrew Benatendi skipped Triple A completely, so did Moncada he, last year. He was a and college other, player. Well Benatendi's a completely different hitter, but Moncada last year, I would argue, is was more raw at the plate than Devers is right now. Mm-hmm. And they promoted him to the big leagues when they had a hole to fill at third base. In September. In September. And I, I, I think I agree with you that it's unlikely we see him before then. But it's one of those things that if you know, we come around to mid-August and Red Sox third basemen are doing nothing and they decide, you know, after the trade deadline that there wasn't good value to go out and get a third baseman there. If he's still hitting, you know, well and has, isn't shown, showing any signs of tiring down after a long season, then I wouldn't rule it out given how how all in the Red Sox are and how it's pretty clear they view him as the long-term answer at third base that if if they think he can help, they won't hesitate to call him up. Yeah, I mean, he can play the position defensively as well, which I think we, I, I think we're more certain he can play third base well defensively than we, or certainly than we were versus Mancata. Oh know? yeah, um, I, he was a better defender than Mancata. So there's that. that last year um, too. But I just, I, I, I don't want to rush a guy. You know, in response to the people who want to get him up there now, I don't want to rush a guy to the majors because you are now on option four. <laughs> yeah, you know, with who's playing? Th- I don't even know who's playing third Rutledge. base for Red Sox today. Oh Rutledge. God! Oh, today I, I haven't looked at the line. Um, I'm looking right now. I would assume Rutledge. Um, obviously, it is so, Rutledge. Yeah, because you've got Sandoval, Holt, and Hernandez all on the DL. Uh, I mean, for all we know, what, like one of them comes off the DL and is playing fine. In a well, Brock, Brock Holt, uh, he's rehabbing. He's playing for Portland today, actually. Also, well, so he so he'll be back pretty Holt, soon. Holt was rehabbing, um, I guess, he, you know, with vertigo. And he was rehabbing and then came off of rehab. Didn't they shut him down? They shut him down for a couple days because his symptoms weren't subsiding. And they just started him back up today, gotcha. on Saturday. So. I, the disappointing thing for me is I thought Hernandez could have got a – I was looking forward to seeing him get a yes. long look at third base because yes. I think he can hit. Yeah. And obviously I don't – he's not like the impact hitter that Devers is potentially, but – 
I think he could hit and hold down the position for, you know, hit like 280 with 10 home runs if he was given there, you know, given a couple, given the rest of the season there, mm-hmm. which would be fine. You know, that's a perfectly adequate third baseman for given that he wasn't planned to be the starter. He's supposed to be more of a utility guy. Yeah. But so him going on the DL, that was a little disappointing. But I, I just don't, I agree. I just don't want to rush Devers to like plug a hole that should be, have been filled. And it's, it's interesting to me that they didn't, I guess they probably couldn't have foreseen this much, this many injuries happen, but no. I think it shows also the trouble they had signing priority minor league free agents and the lack of depth they have at the infield positions that, you know, Devin Marrero is on the big league roster right now when he's hitting like under or close to a hundred in Pawtucket. And they had to sign Chase at Day Arnaud off waivers and he's oh, claim off, him, think, yeah. or claim off waivers and he's in the big leagues too. And it just, you know, they, they obviously third base was kind of a question mark going into the year and they just, I don't think they did an adequate job, you know, backing up those infield positions to the high minors, and we're kind of seeing that right now. Well, they, they went and s- did sign Matt Dominguez, who has major league experience, uh, to play third base at Pawtucket. The problem is he's hitting 219, 289, 288 entering today as part of a Pawtucket lineup that has been pretty Not brutal, good. frankly. I mean, Yeah, and I, I saw him. It, was, I mean, yeah, there's not a lot. I, I don't think he's someone you want playing in the big leagues for right. a long time. Well, and it's uh, by the way, if you want to throw your, throw your mic on mute and flick your fan a couple times, but it's you know it, it's it's tough to sign a guy to play third base for you in Pawtucket when Raphael Devers is going to be breathing down that guy's neck, and it's not like you know guys aren't going to do their homework and know that. Uh, just kind of like how we talked about, I think last week, or maybe this might have been it might have been in the radio hit I did this week in Maine. It's, you, it's really hard to sign minor league, minor league free agent starting pitchers when on your major league roster, all the news is that, oh, the Red Sox have six guys for five spots on the major league roster, and they all are either all-stars or up-and-coming young studs like Eduardo Rodriguez. Yeah, true. So it's just, it's it, tough. It's, 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 yeah, it's kind of like a catch-22. It's you build a really good major league squad, and that makes it more difficult to mm-hmm. build minor league depth. But I given how much they've dealt from their quote unquote minor league depth in the past years, it's it's gonna catch up with them at some point. And I think we're kinda yeah, seeing but what third, third baseman did they trade? I mean Moncada, I guess, who's raking right now in I mean, in Charlotte. Moncada, but Aswahe. If Carlos Aswahe was still Carlos Aswahe could have been an option, yeah. He would, I guess he, would that's true. Up, he would have been up in the majors right now playing third base. But Aswahe would have been redundant with Hernandez. I mean, yeah, I guess I, I guess Hernandez but, would have started the year in Pawtucket. That's true. Yeah, and but the point would be though that you know you'd have that guy versus having to go yeah. sign Chase Snyder or yeah. call up Devin I mean, Vera. I'm sure people are screaming Travis Shaw right now because Shaw is hitting for power. But, yeah, I guess uh, there's another would, example. But, but I would I mean, point out that Travis Shaw. I, I mean, I kind of had a discussion uh, on Twitter about this uh, this week. But uh, so Travis Shaw, I'll just bring up his stats right now. Uh, is baseball reference is major league side working. Um, flick your fan again, man. It's getting pretty bad. <laughs> but yeah, so Shaw right now, I guess is, he's brought his on base percentage up a little bit in, in 27 games. He's hitting 274, 316, four, uh, 457 with six bombs. So he's hitting for a lot of power, but the on base skills aren't quite there. Granted, he's brought he's, when I've looked recently. I mean, as, as recently as a week ago, he was hovering right around the 300 line. I think even a little below it. Uh, I I would guess that the uh, you know the slugging is more likely to come down than that the on base percentage is going to continue to trend up. Um, but you know that's a player that might have been nice to have around. So that's that's for sure. Uh, and the other thing is the same trade. Mauricio Dubon is a guy that maybe could have been an option to come up. So yeah, and it's just it's that's volume. You know that's four guys we just picked out. They traded in the last what year over just a little over a year. I mean, and all of them would be in the high minors right now. That's a lot if you think about it, given, you know, given how especially they've been limited in recent years by the new spending caps and everything, that you're not bringing in a lot of talent in the draft or in, you know, international free agency every year as they used to. Mm-hmm. And so when you have, you're trading four guys who could have been potential options in the last year plus, that's, that's a pretty big talent drain from the system. Mm-hmm. So moving along, uh, to, well, actually, let's see. Are there any other Devers questions that we got? 
Um, oh, we actually got a question on Twitter from also from Nick, who's all about Devers apparently, and, and he just most asked, people are. Yeah, I, I don't don't blame them. Um, Chris, th- does the lack of walks from Devers concern you at all? I don't think the super aggressive approach works in MLB. Uh, I'm going to ha- go ahead and chalk it up to small sample size noise. Ian, agree. Um, yeah, it's it's not like approach has been an issue for him in the past. So when approach suddenly looks like an issue for a guy after a one month sample, I mean, look at it this way: in the last, well, entering today in his last five games, he'd walked five or three times. So, yeah, I mean, it was just I think early in the season, and I noticed it when I saw him for those games. Is he was just trying to get out early and attack fastballs early in the count. Mm-hmm. And when you're doing that, you're not going to walk. But I think you know as the season progresses, he's going to start. He'll start working the count more, and I'm not that concerned, especially given I don't think his K rate is no, elevated or anything like that. It wasn't. That's the thing. I it, was just trying to bring that up. That was the Chris Mellon special for a while. Of who cares about walks? I don't care about walks unless a guy's showing a you know plate approach issue or an inability to recognize pitches, and that's also going to come out in the K rate. Yeah, and we're seeing it too at the big league level right now. You know, there are there's a fair few guys who just don't walk that much, and it's not no one really like bats an eye or anything. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. I'm not that concerned. All right, all right. Well, let's move along into other news really quickly. And uh, Stephen Wright's done for the year, and Kyle Kendrick came up. I got asked about this uh, on the radio hit I did this week. Of is there any other help in AAA? We talked a little bit about Henry Owens and Brian Johnson on here in the past week or two, past episode or two. Um, is any surprise that Kendrick was the guy that got the call, even though he kind of had a rough couple of first starts, it looked like he was starting to put it together in his last couple of starts. And then of course he got kind of bombed in his, in his line, his first start for the Red Sox. No, I mean, I think this was always the plan going, uh, going forward was mm-hmm. if they needed someone to come up for more than one start, it was going to be Kendrick cause they had to add him to the roster right, and right. he's somewhat, I mean, I honestly, I saw him once this year and, it was kind of what I expected. And that start was pretty kind of what I expected. You know, I think best case for him, you're going to get like five, six innings and give up four runs. Right. He's not a guy who's going to, you know, he's not been a good major league pitcher. The he's last a, he's a fifth he's, starter. It's He's not a fifth starter. He's a swing. He's like an up well, and down. That, but though I'm saying you're, you're calling him up. Oh, you're not yeah. calling him up to be an ace. Like people are like, Oh, he didn't pitch great. Like, well, yeah, I mean, oh, it was a bad yeah. start, but that's not a whole lot worse than what you're hoping for out of him. Yeah. And, I think that's what they're asking for him is just to keep them in the game because mm-hmm. right now, you know, with Henry Owens, he's working on the delivery. He's walking way too many guys right now. Mm-hmm. He's, I mean, he's not giving up hits, but at the same time, he's got 18 walks and 26 innings, which is just unacceptable. And Brian Johnson, I don't think was lined up for that day. No, I think, he, he would have had to get pushed back two days. And also, I think this is why you, like, this is why you have Kyle Kendrick in your system, you know. Yeah. Brian Johnson isn't going anywhere. I would assume Kendrick has an opt out. I would get. I would or had one. Uh, I would. He probably assume, has one. For, like, I think he has one for mid season. Yeah, but I would have guessed it was June or July. And if you know, if you call up Brian Johnson right then, that's not you know you, that's not necessarily the sign you want to send to him that hey you know we signed you to give you a chance at a big league spot and there's one open but we're going to call up this guy instead. And I actually. But, yeah, go ahead. Finish. Sorry. It, I was just gonna say it doesn't hurt to you know give him three or four starts, see what happens, and if he doesn't work out, then you can turn to Johnson and Owens. And you know we forget like Johnson barely pitched last year. You know it's not like yeah. he's he's got he needs to get some innings under his belt at the AAA level. And as I said, Owens has stuff he needs to work on. So yeah. Well, and I think what it is because someone on Twitter that I was just interacting with, not in, nothing to do with the podcast, uh, said something to me that well, but Johnson has clearly outpitched him in AAA. And I don't think it's about who has outpitched whom. It's about what do you expect. And I think even if you expect, like, let me put it this way. You're not expecting a significantly better result right now with Brian Johnson than you are with Kyle Kendrick. Agreed? Yeah, I mean, I think both of them could, at best, best case, you're looking at six innings, three runs or something like that. Yeah, and I think that's why, like you said, if you're not going to call up Kyle Kendrick here, you're not going to call him up at all, and he's going to use the opt-out midseason, whereas you've got Brian Johnson for a little longer. And like I said, it's not a significantly better, if it even is better, expected outcome with Brian Johnson. So it, no. makes, it makes sense to go with Kendrick here. He'll be in the rotation at least until David Price comes back, which I think you're probably looking at another... End of the month, month I would say. End of the month, yeah. Yeah, they, so, they, someone mapped it out today, and it was like he's two more... Um, Two more like, sim games? Sim, sim games, then three rehab starts, mm-hmm. and like March or May 29th, I think, is like the ETA. 
And that's if everything goes right. So, Correct, which who knows. Hey, for all you know, you're going to need another spot starter. So Yeah. Yeah, so we'll we'll see. Um, but I think it made sense for Kendrick. Um, promotions. We had a whole bunch of chain promotions on May 1st, Ian, and May 2nd. And I guess kind of the highlight here is that uh, the hashtag Stop the Madness campaign is over. Hashtag Free Aniri. Hashtag Free Aniri. And Aniri Tavares is in Pawtucket. Um, I'll just list all of the moves right now. We could talk about the kind of highlights. But uh, Aniri Tavares up to Pawtucket uh, along with – well, let me put it this way. There was one chain promotion that was basically Anuri Tavares to Pawtucket, uh, Junior Lake getting released. Uh, Josh Tobias, the second baseman the Red Sox received in exchange for Clay Buckholtz, moving up from Salem to Portland uh, after he hit really well in Salem. Uh, uh, sorry, Trenton Kemp, uh, who had started the year injured in extended spring training, got added to the Salem roster, and that was kind of that chain promotion. Uh, that happened on the first, and then the next day there was a... <laughs> I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say it, organizational infielder chain promotion of uh, Hecker Manessis up to Pawtucket from Portland, Diener Lopez up to Portland from Salem, Nick Lavulo, uh, Tory's son up to Salem from Greenville, and Jagger Rusconi, who is kind of the highlight of, of this chain promotion, getting added to the Greenville roster from Extended. Uh, Rusconi was healthy. He, he wasn't um, injured or anything but just stayed behind and extended to start the year. And uh, I think they saw enough out of him and extended that they were ready to send him to Greenville. So they sent him to Greenville. Uh, and then I guess kind of the last move that we should mention, a very small one, was Nick Schiartino, uh getting added to the Greenville drive when Isaiah Lucena went on the DL. So that's kind of a catcher move right there. Uh, I guess kind of the highlights for me, Ian, are Tavares, Tobias, and uh, Rusconi. Uh, Tavares was due frankly yeah you think <laughs> and he's i mean he's hit, hit the ground running yeah he, he hit Pawtucket. a couple homers in his first game or second game i think yeah i think yeah second game and then uh he's also been caught stealing and thrown out on the bases another time but you know that'll happen mm-hmm, mm-hmm. um but he's still not playing center field so i don't know shruggy face <laughs> definite shruggy face yeah in three games he had two hits in his first game three hits including the two bombs in his second game uh and he went oh for five in his second game he's playing right field exclusively uh that's because that's the best position that they're comfortable playing him at would love to see him in center field but it's maybe it's just like a yips thing he just can't do it i don't know i'm trying to like i've been running through (laughs) scenarios of why he can't play center field in my head or at least they can't just stick him out there and be like hey play center field today and i can't think of any Except for that. Stop the madness. Now, the new it, Stop the Madness is play him in center field to see if it works. Well, I mean, we, we've got Nick Longy playing in the outfield now, so I think that maybe if we just hammer it home enough, it'll eventually happen. Mm-hmm. Well, and that's the interesting thing with that promotion set, too, is that the Sea Dogs lost an outfielder and gained an infielder, so I think you're going to see a lot more of Nick Longy and Su Wei Lin, who we got a couple of questions about in the outfield. And I, I'm on the record as loving versatility, so yeah. I'm. Very pro, both of those thing, movements. Good thing you're on the record about that. I just wanted to make sure everyone knows. <laughs> um, speaking, and, uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, the Tobias one is not surprising. I think in spring training, I kind of argued that he should start in Portland anyway, because I think he's 25 already. Mm-hmm. Is he 24? I can't get his uh, I'll bring it up, right but anyway. But he's like, he was old. He played a decent amount of games last year in high A. I thought he yeah, he's 24. Shoot. He's November so, of 92. Yeah, it's, it's, that's not that surprising to me that he's uh, already up there, especially given, uh, I'll say, that the Portland second baseman I've seen um, have had their issues. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like, he, I, well, yeah. it's kind of funny, you know, the, the, with, with Devin Marrero getting called up to, the, to majors uh, with, uh, with the injury to Marco Hernandez, it's funny, the, poor, the Pawtucket Red Sox lost the worst hitter in the system, but the counter promotion was Jose Rosario going up from Portland to Pawtucket, and so the Pawtucket Red Sox now had the second worst hitting player in the system. In the oh, is Jose Rosario player. the second worst hitting player in the system? Yeah, to uh, second only to Devin Marrero. He so also far. might be one of the worst defensive players in the system because I think I've seen him make five errors this year or something like All that. Right. Well, there you go. He made three in one game, so that was interesting. Hmm. Speaking of the yips, uh, but yeah, with it's worth noting with Tobias. Tobias had 126 at bats in High A last year, and then had another 87 this year. And in those 87, he was hitting 345, 412, 494. So pushing him to Double A, as you said, giving his age made a lot of sense. 
So, agree. Agreed. Um, speaking of playing in the field, Michael Chavis, after DHing since coming back from his elbow inflammation, finally played in the field for the first time yesterday. So that's nice. Not a whole lot to say there. I don't think, but worth noting. Um, Brandon Workman came up for a hot minute to the majors and had one uh, one outing. Ian, uh, what, did you get to see him at Pawtucket? I did not. He was like one of two relievers you, I haven't seen. Have you got any reports him. yet on Velo or anything like that? I, mean, I think we it's, it's up the, compared to when I saw him yeah, last year. Because when I saw him last year, it wasn't. It didn't look good. He was like eighty six, eighty eight. Um, there wasn't a lot there, but it seems like the stuff's coming back. And yeah, what the one this good now is third year from Tommy John. Uh, second? second, second, yeah. Second year back, so some guys it takes longer, and um, you know, just good for him. It's long road back, and it's nice to see guys, you know, mm-hmm. can make it all the way back. Yeah, we we kind of assume Tommy John is just kind of a whatever uh, it's situation, but it really isn't. Uh, guys yeah. sometimes don't get their stuff back. So when I mean, you see like John Lamb, I think is or John Lamb and Johnny Venters mm-hmm. are two of the best examples of that. Yeah, and I mean, for a guy in the system, you know, a guy who had the Tommy John before he got drafted was Chris Johnson whose best pitch in college was his curveball, and he just never got his curveball back, and that was part of why he just kind of became org arm slash up and down arm as a you know supplemental round pick. Except he's making $5 million a year right now and playing in Korea or Japan or one of those well, things. There you so go. Good yeah. for him. Good for him. Um, and then the last thing I just wanted to mention is our players of the month for the month of April. Uh, on the pitching side, it was Sean Anderson. On the hitting side, winning a narrow victory was uh, Austin Rye from the Salem Red Sox. Basically, a lot of Salem Red Sox were in contention, frankly. Uh, Rye, in, in 15 games, hit 333, 429, 574. He had 10 doubles. No one else in the system had seven, which was part of why he was able to overcome the sample size thing. But uh, we, we give more of the benefit of the doubt to catchers for anyone who's like, well, Michael Chavis had 13 games, and he hit better. Uh, yeah, well, Chavis basically only played the last two weeks of the month, so we kind of DQ'd him. Frankly. He also didn't play the field. And he wasn't playing in the field either. Um, not that we were, I mean, that was a knock against him, not a reason. To, I, I straight up wanted to disqualify him for the sample size. But uh, Chavis did have a nice month. Um, but granted, his sample size was small enough that it basically a nice five game uh, hot streak was enough to drive, you know, drive his numbers up. Uh, also in contention was Sue Lin, who I mentioned we have some questions about, who uh, in Portland hit 347, 407, 612. Uh, we'll talk about him in a minute. Uh, Josh Ockamy in Salem, who hit 343, 432, 571 with three bombs. Uh, Woodland also had three bombs. Uh, and to the aforementioned Inuri Tavares in Portland hit 377, 473, 475. Um, Tobias had a pretty nice month, as did Tate Matheny. Really a lot of guys in Salem. Five of the top seven hitters uh, in April were from Well, I Salem. think that that kind of lends itself to uh, Baseball America did a project where they talked about the park factors for all the minor league parks. Mm-hmm. And Salem, obviously, is a big power suppressor, but mm-hmm. it was one of the best parks in the Carolina League for average. Interesting. Because I guess it's huge, yeah. I would assume. It that is. would be why. It's, it's, it's big, and it's got high walls. So I think that's kind of something that we're seeing a lot of guys, you know, the high averages. But we're also seeing a decent amount of power this year, which is interesting. So Yeah, high walls. Maybe Salem. Walls. Yeah. Well, in the Carolina League, too, it's, it's Frederick. If you wind up playing in Frederick a lot, um, Frederick is a pretty good park to hit in. Yeah, um, and I, and I, they had a series in Frederick, I think. Midway. And also with how small the Carolina League is, if it's a down year pitching wise, you know, mm-hmm. you're going to see big numbers because it's what eight teams, I think, only. Yep. So, oh no, they added two this year, didn't they? Oh, or is that the I South Atlantic League? I don't know. No, that's the South Atlantic League added two teams. I'm sorry. So it's only eight teams. So when you're looking at, you know, you're playing the same seven teams mm-hmm. rotating, and it's not even even with that. You play the three teams in your division more than the others. You're seeing the same guys over and over, and if they're bad, then you're going to hit well. Right, right. Um, and then on the pitching side, Sean Anderson was a pretty easy call. Uh, Anderson in, uh, where is he? Let's see. In five, six starts. Oh, I don't have it in April. Sorry. In five starts, uh, 27 two-thirds innings, uh, only gave up four runs, struck out 24, walked seven, gave up 18 hits. So the whip was below one. Uh, he threw had well really, yesterday again. Yeah, threw well yesterday again. He had a good month. Uh, also in contention were, uh, let's see, Daniel Gonzalez had, in 17 innings had an ERA of 104, uh, 17 strikeouts to seven walks and nine hits, only gave up two earned runs. Uh, so his whip was below one. Uh, Hildemar Rocania, uh, who the two, both Gonzalez and Rocania were in piggyback roles. Rocania only threw 14 and two-thirds innings, but ERA was 184, whip below one, 16 strikeouts and 14 and two-thirds innings. Uh, and probably the only other guy worth talking about, Jalen Beeks, who in four starts uh, had an ERA of 199, 
whip of 106, 26 strikeouts to 10 walks, and 22 and two-thirds innings. So, And he threw really well today also. He's shoved today, too, yeah. so that's good. Five innings, two hits, two walks, eight strikeouts. Yes. And if you want to read more about him, we've actually written about him twice. This yeah, year. our news page, so, recap, news page recap for the week. Nian had a couple of scouting scratches, one on uh, Anuri Tavares, Danny Mars, and Cole Sturgeon. Uh, another on Nick Longy, Suwe Lin, uh, Jalen Beeks, Ty Buttry, and uh, Jake Cosart. Uh, Chaz Fiorino had the write-up on Trey Ball's first start of the season. And uh, we mentioned our scouting updates. We had scouting report updates on 10 position players and six pitchers. So we're starting to get back in the groove on that with the system restart over. So, uh, yeah, make sure you check out news.soxprospects.com. Uh, a lot of content going up this year. A lot of that content. Was something trying. we talked about and we're mm-hmm. trying to, you know, bring – bring back and be a little more organized with it. Without so, uh, it without it just being clickbait yeah. content. Screw no, click, good screw content. clickbait. Screw clickbait. Good content. We're good incorporating content. GIFs now. We've got video. We've got scouting reports. We've got news. We've got uh, mm-hmm. write-ups. We've got everything. So yes. check it out. Well, let's get to some uh, some listener questions. And actually the, the, actually, the first topic I want to get to really isn't a listener question. We've got a couple of questions that were internal that people requested we talked about. Um, one, our podcast editor, Joe Tetral, mentioned... The uh, club has, at the time he emailed me three days ago, 28 pitchers, some of whom were admittedly org guys, not prospects, but 28 pitchers with it who are averaging a strikeout at inning or better uh, that had pitched at least seven innings uh, with fewer than 60 guys who have logged at least an inning at one of the four clubs. Um, you know, highlights included Jamie Callahan, whose strikeout rate, he's got 18, or sorry, 15 strikeouts to no walks. Uh, Workman's got 11 strikeouts to one walk. Uh, Beeks, Travis Lakins, Mike Schwarin, all striking out guys uh, more than a batter in inning. Uh, he was he was just wondering if it was a de- developmental goal being realized or some random statistical noise. Uh, I'd probably say somewhere in between. You had some more thoughts on that. Yeah, I, I can't remember where I read it, but earlier this year, um, someone, probably Alex Spear or someone like that, wrote an article talking about that the organizational philosophy has changed a little bit where mm-hmm. they're allowing pitchers to throw cutters earlier in their careers and they're encouraging them, them to throw all their pitches when they're, you know, in the low minors. And in past years, we kind of talked about with Henry Owens was the best example of that, that he would more or less not throw his change up in some starts and he'd just be focusing on his fastball or on his curveball. And as a result, the strikeout numbers would be kind of suppressed. And I'm, I'm just wondering if the change of allowing guys to throw their, their best pitches more than they would in past years or throw mm-hmm. more pitches and encouraging them to, in fact, has made a difference. And where, you know, it's obviously going to be a lot easier to strike guys out if you can throw all your pitches. Mm-hmm. So I'm For just wondering sure. if that's played any part. I also think, though, that this the the way that the organization, the depth positions, are kind of leading towards strikeout pitchers. Like, they have a lot of right-handed relievers who can miss bats. True. And that's, I'm guessing, a majority of the guys there. And also, they do have some decent starting pitching prospects, especially in the low minors who have bat missing stuff. Guys like Sean Anderson, Travis Lakins, mm-hmm. Darwin's and Hernandez, and uh, Mike Schwarin. So, yeah, I think it's kind of just the a combination of a few things. Yeah. And just to kind of follow up on that, the, the reason, the, the idea behind not letting guys throw their best pitch if they had one really kind of dominating pitch, like you know, Owens uh, and his change-up. What are the other ones that come to mind were Pat Light with his splitter, uh, Brandon Workman's cutter, uh, was that they wanted the guys to not rely on only that pitch and try to work on some of their other pitches. You know, you're, you're, you're working on developing guys and not on, you know, putting up numbers, right? But I think the argument the other direction is that you want the guys to learn how to pitch with those pitches, you know? And just if they're starting to throw it, more than half their pitches, you tell them not to. I, I, that's the thing that kind of always struck me as strange about that is like, well, if a guy's throwing it too much, tell him to stop throwing it so much. You know, I don't see why shelving it is necessarily the way to go as opposed to just, you know, maybe, you know, back off on it a little bit and, you know, this inning maybe just work on the changeup or the curveball or whatever or, you know, spotting the fastball. Um, but instead of shelving it for an entire season or two, that just seemed kind of silly to me. Well, I also think, too, that it's helping – being able to throw all the pitches, helping guys work deeper into games. Like Sean Anderson pitched in the seventh inning yesterday. Um, which Travis never Lake, happened in Greenville. Which, yeah. Mm-hmm. Like Greenville guys, you would never, you would see maybe five innings at most, mm-hmm. maybe six if their pitch count was down. And we're routinely seeing guys like Jalen Beeks, Anderson, excuse me, Travis Lakins are pitching into the seventh inning. And so I think that's definitely 
we're seeing kind of the fruits of that with guys working deeper in the outings too. Mm-hmm. And and part of that, especially at the lower levels, though, was that guys would be who if they're going to be on innings limits for the year, if you let them throw seven innings every outing, they're going to have to stop pitching in July. You know, yeah. you, you want you also want guys to get used to a 144 game schedule plus playoffs. Yeah. Um, well, especially too for the young guys, that's quite. It's a pretty big difference. Um, yeah. In the number of games coming from college, where you're playing, you know, sixty games, sixty-five, seventy games, maybe if you make the college world series, versus as you said, a hundred and forty plus. Right. 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 So, uh, you know, good good idea for something to talk about um, from Joe, and I guess actually something that Mike mentioned to us that we decided to kind of make a podcast topic um, that we probably should have talked about earlier is uh, obviously on the Sox prospects main page on the top 20 we have our projections for uh prospects in the top 20 on a the the two to eight scouting scale and uh for more about that you can go to the about page it's linked on the top page it's socksprospects.com slash about dot html and uh the question right now we've got Raphael devers graded as a uh a six going forward um with a kind of potential range of four to seven, the floor being a four, the ceiling being a seven. And just to give some context to those numbers, we have a six uh, as a impact everyday player and occasional all-star. The example there is Jacoby Ellsbury, which I think gives people the idea. I think that that works well. Uh, a seven is a regular all-star like an Anthony Rizzo. Um, so for, for context, I think, what did we have Ben? Did we have Ben Intendi as a seven before he graduated? No, I think he was a six. Was he still a Could- six? Because you think about it, like, I'm looking at the the MLB official scout evaluation chart right now, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and, um, like, a guy who's a roll six is, like, a 275 to 295 hitter with yep. 20 to 25 home runs. Mm-hmm. I'm, I'm, those aren't the exact numbers, but close. Those are the ballparks. And versus, like, a roll seven is basically, like, a 300 hitter with 30 home runs. Right. And it's really it's tough hard to project a guy that. as, like, the realistic outcome. As a ceiling, no doubt Devers has that ceiling. But realistically, would anyone complain if Devers was a 290 guy who hit 25 home runs a year? No. no. And if he does that, he's probably an all-star every year, or, or a occasional all-star, you mm-hmm. know, depending on his defense. Yeah, so, and uh, just yeah. to give people the wins above replacement uh, chart, too, that we have, uh, we have for a six, it's a three to five war per season, and a seven is a five to seven per season, which there are only a few guys you can count on for that year in and year out. Um, I'm going to try and pull up fan graphs leaderboard from last year really quick. But it's like you said, it's just, it's really hard to just project that as a guy's kind of, this is what we think he's going to be. Yeah. But last year in baseball, there were 23 players who were worth five wins above replacement. Exactly. So you're basically saying that you think Devers is one of the top 20 players in baseball. And well, yeah. I think he absolutely could be that. I don't, I wouldn't say that's the most likely outcome. Yeah. The only you Red know. Sox in that range were um, D- Dustin Betts. Pedroia was 5.2 and Mookie Betts was 7.8. Yeah. Um, and a lot of Pedroia's, I would guess, came from his defensive value. Uh, yes. He was one of the better defenders in that group. And so it, it's with Devers, you know, I would say it's probably there's probably, what, 60% chance he's like a roll six player, maybe right. 30 per- or 20% chance that he's below that, and 20% chance he's that's probably high above, maybe a 30% chance he's below, 10% chance he's high, I don't know. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's... It's tough to figure out exactly, but it's just, I, I don't think the most likely outcome is a roll seven, and that's why I wouldn't go there yet. Well, and, that's, and the problem with doing that is it's like you're projecting a package, right? A package of tools and skills, yeah. And it's like they all could go up or down from where you project them, right? So he yeah. could be a roll six. So look, here's the example, right? The, and the, there was an article on Fangraphs this week written by Dave Cameron about this guy, Xander Bogarts. Yeah, what a weird season. I got, I've had well, some questions on Twitter. A and weird I, season, and it's just what he has become in the majors is not what I would have guessed, right? Because the power is nowhere near where I thought it was. The hit tools pro- above where I thought it would be. Well, what did he hit last year? He had 19 home runs last year. Uh, Bogarts. Yeah, or did, I, did, I, did he only have like 14? Last year he hit 21 home runs. I think that's about what I expected. Yeah, but didn't he? I mean, slugging 446. Okay, I would have thought. I, I thought he had like 
30 home runs was like his peak, but I thought he was like a 20 to 25 home run guy. I guess. I mean, he hit 294, 358, 446 last year. Yeah. Which is above where I thought he was. But like the year before that, he hit. 320, 355, 421. I guess that's maybe the player I was Yeah, describing. that's more of an outlier. Seven home one. runs. But this year is the outlier. This year, I don't think he has a home run, does he? Yeah, he has one, I think. Oh, he has one? Uh, or does he? No, he doesn't have any home no, runs I don't yet. think he has one. He's, any... he's got 30 hits. He's hitting 326, and he has three extra base hits. Yeah, that's what I mean. It's it's so weird. I Yeah. yeah. You know? I don't know. It's very strange. And he's getting on base at a 380 clip, which I never would have projected for him. And But that's the thing with Devers. It's like he could be, you know, he might not get to that five worth threshold because maybe he doesn't become as good a defender as we think he can. Or, you know, they have to move him to another position. Well, last year, to be fair, last year something. he was at like four. He was above 4.5. He was at 4.7 on fan groups. Yeah. So he may as well have been in that group. As Jackie yeah. Bradley was at 4.8. Again, that's fan graphs war. So, yeah. Yeah, it's inter- it's an interesting thought. I, I, I think I'm with you on that. Though. I think though Give that the six. fact that we're having that conversation yeah. shows how yep. good a prospect Devers is. Exactly. I was looking today. Actually, it was funny. It's we've been spoiled over the last couple of years mm-hmm. by the system because mm-hmm. I was looking today and it's like we only have three, four guys projected as a six ceiling in the top in the top ten right now, and I would argue that that's generous on at least one of those guys to give them a six ceiling. Let me bring the page up so I can follow you here. It's, it's, it's Sam Travis. I just I don't see the first division like consistent. Also, well, like, yeah, we might have to talk about that. But but um, but anyway, in past years, you know, guys we would project, I would say, had a role six ceiling would drop down into like borderline number ten. And you know, it well, just shows how much they've dealt from the system because you know the guy, the Espinosas, Margos, Moncada, Kopech, you know, that's all role six or higher ceilings. Um, yeah, well, you look sure at the system right now. Guys. We have we have four guys with six ceilings. That's what I mean. Oh, that's what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah, that's what you said. Sorry. Yeah, I yeah. That's what I'm saying. Is like yeah, it yeah. used to be like guys with six ceilings would drop into like the teens, and now it's there's right. like three of them. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah, and it's just there's there's no yeah. Although yeah, uh, I guess yeah. Looking at it, but there's I, really no one I disagree with either. Oh, I guess Brian Mata's got a seven ceiling. Yeah, I would not go a seven ceiling. I'd probably say a six on him. But yeah, yeah. and I, I think though that. We're going to see some things change this year because something we didn't bring up in the news, which I think is worth mentioning, was uh, Jesse Sanchez from MLB.com published ah. his international yes. uh, prospect rankings Good and call. where he thinks teams are going to sign. And the Red Sox were linked with his number two player. Three. Do you have number? There were three players in the top no, thirty. But I think it was, it was the number three though, or number three, including yeah, Daniel the top Flores. Catches. Yeah, that, so do you want to talk about that a little bit? I, I think we're going to see them go pretty heavy in Latin America this year, and then, of I course, the draft, they didn't lose any picks. So. I would be stunned if they didn't go heavy, especially I, after they weren't able to sign anybody for the past year. But um, I think it's going to be volume. Oh, yeah, okay, it was number and, two. You were right. I'm sorry, I yeah. got confused. It's the, the, the number, they're all from Venezuela. Um, Which is no the, surprise he, there. Yeah, no, the Red Sox love scouting Venezuela. It's the, well, and the other thing is they team. have an advantage there because some teams just don't go down there. Well, some teams like, don't go down there, and they've done a good job under Eddie Romero of cultivating a relationship with players exactly. down there. Um, exactly. So, you know, the, the, the three that are connected to the Red Sox are his number two prospect, Daniel Flores, uh, who's a catcher, who is um, – God, what was the hyper – there was one hyperbolic statement about him that he was like the this best. Is the best defensive catcher ever or something? <laughs> out of, yeah, out of, as an uh, IFA, which – You're going to hear me typing. I'm going to bring it up. That's um, Well, but the thing is, I mean, this is also the, the scouting – um, community that gave us the Barry Bonds and uh, Miguel Tejada comparisons for Oscar Tejada and Engel Beltre. That was fantastic. I'm glad someone dug that up. I, yeah. I got a good chuckle with that. And, um, yeah, yeah, so those... The other two guys are there in his number 13 prospect, third baseman Danny Diaz, and his number 20 prospect, shortstop Anthony Flores. Uh, I know Ben Badler from Baseball America had at least projected Flores uh, to the Red Sox, but he apparently had – oh, sorry, uh, Anthony Flores. Whoa, did I screw that up? I probably yeah. He had, he had the two shortstops projected. Well, but no, no, no. But I, I have. Are they both Flores, or did I type one wrong? Flores. And they are both Diaz. Flores. Yeah, no, there's two Flores. Flores's. Yeah. Okay. So he had Anthony Flores, the shortstop, and third baseman Danny Diaz, who's currently a shortstop, but um, apparently projects to move to third to the Red Sox. But he had Daniel Flores, the catcher, projected to I think the Mets. 
No, Rangers. No, the Rangers, who yeah. also are heavy into Latin America. And Venezuela, especially, too. Mm-hmm. So it'll be interesting to see if Badler changes his projection or not. So Yeah, and I mean, this is the kind of thing we've been missing out. And you think about it, you know, it's been two years since they've been able to sign these international guys. Mm-hmm. And the top ones would be probably in the making the gr- jump to Greenville this year after, you know, two years in the complex league. And there just aren't those guys right now. Well, I don't know about so, that. No, maybe because, okay, maybe Lowell. Because the guy, think about the fact that the guys that they had in the DSL last year were the Simon Muziotis and um, Albert, Alberto Guimaros of the world. But they lost all those guys. But my point is, they were in the DSL last year. Oh and right, because I forgot the first year the you can't Coast play. League. They yeah, were yeah, in yeah. The Gulf Coast League or Lowell this year. So, I forgot that. Of course, you can't play the I year you, you were, sign. I think you're yeah, going to see a bubble that rises up to Greenville next year. Yeah, and I did, you're right, I did the, the math wrong. Because, yeah, they can't play the year they signed, so we won't right. see any of these guys until next year so, at the earliest. Yeah, I think next year and the year after, you're going to see a dearth of, of international free agents in, like, Greenville and Salem. Well, and now there's a hard cap, so it's not like they're going to lose. Well, you know, the, you the thing with the hard cap, and I said this on our, our forum, uh, forum.soxprospects.com, and by the way, I'd like to invite everybody out there to, Come join the conversation on there. We're starting to get some really good conversation going on there. But uh, the, the, the thing is, if you have a cap, okay, money is no longer an advantage. Nope. So I think you're – and people think, oh, well, the Red Sox are going to lose their money advantage. Yeah, but they've also become very good at cultivating relationships with players at young ages and their uh, Buscones, their trainers – and, and getting out and finding these guys. They've done very good jobs with that. Yes, they've also had the money to throw at the likes of Devers and Anderson Espinosa, but they've also found guys for cheap down there. We, uh, well, and that's, we, we talk about it all the time. You know, guys like Renil Raudis was 250 k Yeah. Um, Brian Mata was, what, 20 k or something? Yeah, 20 k And even Lorenz, Bogarts. Yeah. Bogarts, Bogarts was, was 400. 400. That's... You know, but even the guys, guys in the minors right now, Lorenzo Cedrola was 35K. Stanley Espinal was 10K. Um, you know, that you can find value with cheap guys. Mm-hmm. And it's just, you got to have the scouts down there and be willing to put in the work. Even and when the they Basabes. Had, mm-hmm. Yes. Even when they had the money, they were getting guys to sign with them for less than other teams were offering. Yeah. and and But I think this year is going to be interesting because I, I assume it's the same rules. The 300K doesn't count. Mm-hmm. Is that true? So uh, I, no, I think it's changed, but there's a there's a money amount that doesn't count, but I think it's less. Might be two hundred k. I or think it's like yeah. two hundred now. But I I, I think that what we're going to see is I I would not be surprised if we see like the biggest international uh, signing class we see in a while because they're going to want I think they want to go back to they do to, they've to, said uh, that they the an article. Teams. Devin Drellick for CSNNE wrote an article about how the Red Sox are going to try and upgrade their Dominican Academy. Uh, because it's at this point 15 years old. Yeah, it's that's kind of, true. They want to bring it back up to the state of state of the art, so to speak. And uh, they did say Sam Kennedy did say in there that they want to go back to having two teams in the DSL. And to do that, though, they need to have a big class. Yeah, so. I mean they're going to have a very large roster this year, so they're not quite as far as you might think, but um, they are going to have to go with a big class this year. Yeah. Basically, it's a big roster, but it's going to be a big roster of guys who may or may not have still been with the team. Um, had they not been planning to go to two teams in the future. Yeah, um, sure. But anyway, okay, we're behind on our questions, so let's... We are. Our first question uh, from the emails, uh, this one's a little old at this point. Uh, it's been in the hopper for a minute, but um, it's from Mike. He asks, are the injured minor league players coming back soon? Kyrie Washington, CJ Chatham, Mark Brakeman. Uh, don't get injury updates from team websites. Thank you. Uh, part of the reason I read this old email is just to say, there really aren't a lot of injury updates coming out of the minors. And frankly, even when you cover the minors like we do, you can't really use up your capital emailing teams media guys every week on how is the number 40 prospect in the system doing coming back from injury. You know, it's you, you only have so much capital you can use. Well, and sometimes they don't even know. And so most of, a lot of the times they don't. A lot of yeah, times they don't like, even know. Teams just keep it close to the best. They do. And... Um, I mean, CJ Chatham... Uh, no news on him. He's still in extended spring training with a hamstring injury. I would yeah. assume he's getting close. Um, I don't know. But we don't know. Kyrie Washington is back. Brakeman is not back um, as far as those specific guys go. But uh, if you go to the transactions page at Sox Prospects, that's SoxProspects.com uh, slash transactions.htm. If you go there, uh, th- if we know what a guy's injury is when he goes on the DL, we will 
mark it when they go on the DL. So you can just do like a control F for the guy's name. And if we know, it'll be there. And if we don't know, it won't say anything. So yeah. thanks for the question, Mike, but wish you had more for you. We don't. Um, our next question is from frequent emailer Brady Childs. And Brady says, I was looking over the 40 man on y'all's site. <clears throat> so he's apparently from the South and uh, had some questions about the technicalities of options. Under which circumstances does a team need permission from a player to send him down? And what does, quote, outwriting someone to the minors mean? Is outwriting someone from the minors different than outwriting them off the 40 man, or is it a result of a DFA? Okay, lots to unpack there. Uh, first of all, options, which we also actually, I'll just thank you for the email, Brady, and I'll also get a uh, related email if I can find it. Uh, da, 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 where is it? Uh, that's the Ben Taylor question. That's this one. Um, oh, we got a question from Andy. And uh, Andy O'Donnell asks, how does Robbie Ross Jr., who's been optioned to Pawtucket, still have options? Can you explain how option years work, et cetera? These are kind of hand in hand. So options. Okay. When a player becomes a professional player, they begin with three option years. Okay. An option year is a year in which you can be sent up and down to and from the minors from the major league roster while you are on the 40 man roster as many times as the team likes. So for example, player gets added to the 40 man in the off season. Let's say, let's say he was rule five eligible. Okay. The Red Sox begin the year to begin the year. They option him to Pawtucket player begins the year in Pawtucket. He is optioned. They call said player up from the minors on April 20th. They send him back down on April 28th. I didn't mean anything by the April 20th thing, by the way, get all your minds out of the gutter. Um, they call him back up and down three more times during the year or two more times during the year. The player has not used three options. He has only used one option for the year. Okay, it's it's for the entire year. So it's not the number. You know, it's not like if a guy gets optioned, there's one option. Um, there's also some other some other more nuanced rules, such as um, if you are optioned for fewer than 20 days in a season, you do not burn an option. It's called burning an option, by the way. Uh, so if you're down for fewer than 20 days, you do not burn an option. Um, other rules, if you option a player down from the major league roster, you cannot call him back up within 10 days unless a player goes on the DL. Um, so for example, right now, Steve Selsky cannot come up unless the Red Sox put a player on the DL to call him up, um, because he was optioned fewer than 10 days ago. Uh, actually Monday will be 10 days. So when y'all listen to this, it will be at 10 days, but as we record this on Saturday, he can't come up yet. Um, so that's options. Okay, you only need to option a guy if he is still on your 40-man roster. Now, um, as far as outwriting a player, outwriting is outwriting is outwriting. If you outright a player to the minors, you are outwriting him off of the 40-man roster. Okay, um, a, a player can be outrighted. I be, okay, the outright rules are really difficult. They are very convoluted. A lot of baseball roster rules are, rules are very convoluted and difficult. So I'm pretty sure the following is true. Okay. And I also want to give some credit to the cub reporter.com, which has a really good list of kind of the rules um, for roster rules and things like that. If a player is on the 40 man and has five years of service time, he can refuse being outrighted to the minors. And that's outrighted off of the 40 man roster. Okay. Um, if he refuses, I believe he becomes a free agent. Um, if he does not refuse the outright assignment, he becomes a free agent at the end of the year. So that's five years of MLB service time. If a player has fewer than five, but three or more years of MLB service time, the first time he is outrighted, he cannot refuse it, but he can, out, he can refuse the outright if he has already been outrighted once. Okay, and again, if he refuses to be outrighted, he becomes a free agent. Okay, and again, the same thing. If he doesn't refuse and he goes to the minors, he becomes a free agent at the end of the year. Okay, so those are those rules. Before you reach three years of service time, the team can outright you off of the 40-man roster. Um, I believe you must clear waivers uh, in order to be outrighted. Um, I'm not as certain about that, but I believe you have to clear waivers in order to be outrighted. I think I can't find this. But I believe a player can be outrighted once without clearing waivers, but I'm not positive about that. But if you see, no, sorry, that's wrong. If you see that a player has been outrighted to the minors, he has cleared waivers. Okay, so 
I think that answers all of the questions. Ian, do you do you have any confusion after that? Admittedly, probably rough explanation about no. the outright rules. Yeah, Does no. that makes sense. Okay. Yeah. So thank you for those questions, uh, Dave. Uh, sorry, Andy. I know a Dave O'Donnell. That's why. Uh, Andy O'Donnell and uh, Brady uh, Childs. Thank you for those questions. Um, another kind of meta question that we got from Pat who I believe also asked a similar question on Twitter, so we'll hit these at the same time. Uh, the email question Pat Walsh asked, and Pat uh, is one of our patrons on Patreon, so thank you, Pat. Um, he says, selfish question since I live in Tewksbury right next to Lowell, uh, but could you chat about uh, what Lowell is all about when it comes to the Sox? Being a short season, is it really just meant for draft picks to finish their summers? And we got a similar question on Twitter, which, again, I, I'm assuming it's Pat. Um, can you? I would love to hear a section about what each minor league club is for. Um, you know, i.e. Lowell, why do the Red Sox send players there and when? Uh, Ian, I'll start with a rough explanation, then you can go into a little bit more detail, uh, although, you know, don't write a book just given the amount of time we're at so far in the podcast. But the simple answer is that each level of the minors is one step closer to the majors and therefore more advanced. That's kind of the easy question. Um as Ian had kind of mentioned also earlier in triple a and to a smaller degree, double a is where you start getting some of the minor league lifers. Um, double a, I think you get more kind of minor league lifers right in triple a. You've got guys who are, you know, major league taxi squad have some time in the majors and, you know, they're trying to get back there. Uh, and for that reason, frankly, you hear a little bit about, you know, teams sometimes almost want to keep prospects away from triple a. Cause you get a lot of guys who don't have great attitudes because they think that they're, they should be in the majors and they're not, and they're really bitter about it. Um, so there's that kind of aspect of it. And then I could just say lower in the minors, you have guys who are all really younger guys who are on their way up. Uh, and I guess, Ian, I will throw to you with that. I guess maybe starting with, if you have anything to add about Pawtucket and Portland, and then maybe just working your way down from a ball. No, that's yeah. I think that's it. Um, Salem is usually where you get guys who, you get the advanced college guys from the previous year's draft. Uh, from yeah, so like last year we saw Travis Lakins, who was a college guy from a school that I don't like, starting in Salem. That's, um, that's the, year the, after the Ohio State University, right? Ugh, gross. The year after he was drafted, um, and you get guys like that, and then you get you know guys who just excelled in, at Greenville, which is kind of the year before, or guys who the next step in their um, development is up to Salem from Greenville. Where Greenville is the first full season affiliate, and there you usually get, you know, that's where most college draft picks from the year before start, and mm-hmm. then um, the more advanced high school guys, i.e. Jay Groom, will start there. And then also you'll get um, usually the younger guys who have put in a year or two in the short season affiliates, which we'll get to in a second, guys like Lorenzo Cedrola this year, um, Jagger Rusconi, who we talked about earlier, Tyler Hill who were kind of the raw, more athletic, but needed some seasoning development time um, before they were ready for a full season ball. And uh, you get guys like that in their second or third year with the organization. Then to answer specifically about Lowell, Lowell's the, the highest uh, short season affiliate. It starts its season in mid-June. And that's where usually you're going to see the college guys. So it starts up, I think, after the draft. And um, or just after the draft, and yeah. once th- those college guys sign, most of them will get sent to Lowell, and we'll see them, you know, in two to three inning stints, which is pretty pretty common across all teams. And also, you're going to see some young, uh, the younger high school guys, guys like Nick Hamilton um, in the system right now are most likely going to head there, who were too raw to send to a full season affiliate and um, have been in the complex league. Pro- were most likely started here in the GCL or the year before in the yeah, GCL. Well, They'll head to Lowell. Yeah, Hamilton, I would say, probably isn't the best example because he actually spent two years in the GCL. Yeah, but. which is kind of uncommon. But, um, yeah, so Lowell's kind of, it's, you'll see the guys there. It's it's a mix of, it's an interesting mix, which is what makes scouting guys at Lowell kind of difficult is, you know, you're going to get a lot of 22 and 23-year-old college guys, but then you're also going to have some 18 and 19-year-olds. So that's an inter- interesting mix. And then the Gulf Coast League is the lowest state side affiliate, and that's where you'll see, the guys coming over from the DSL the year before and where they send, you know, the raw high school guys that they drafted or um, the kind of the college filler guys who they needed. You know, maybe you need a second baseman in the GCL. So you take some guy in the 30th round and send him there. 
So again, that's kind of a mix of it's mostly younger guys than Lowell, though, and generally the the brand of baseball. It's the guys who you know they're not ready or they're not you know far along, far enough along developmentally to handle um, a like a more structured environment like Lowell, where you know you're pitching in a stadium with fans and everything. Whereas the GCL is more of just on the backfield. It's kind of like a more laid back, more spring training feel. Mm-hmm. And then probably just to cap it off, the Dominican Summer League is it's basically Latin American guys glorified Legion ball for yeah. Latin American players, um, which is why we tend to more or less ignore stats from down there beyond yes. are the stats good or are the stats bad stats down there don't mean a lot and nope. it's pretty hard to get info. And I would say, I mean, I teams don't even scout it really. So it, yeah. there's a reason why, I mean, even the Gulf coast, I mean, well, let's put it this way. Teams when they're scouting other organizations, I, this actually surprised me. I learned this a couple of years ago or a year ago. Um, most teams don't even scout short season ball. No, you do full season ball only. Yeah, I, I, that stunned me. I was That's very why. surprised by that. I mean, when you're getting info on guys who are in the GCL or Lowell, uh, either you know you'll have like you're not going to have a guy specifically assigned to the right. team there. Maybe you'll have a guy who's in the region and he'll just catch a game or two. Mm-hmm. But yeah, as you said, very few teams go all the way down there. It's like a special assignment, like, hey, go see Jay Groom. Exactly. Or like, hey, you know, we're talking about this team in trade. Go watch their yeah. short season yeah. team. See if there's anything That's you when like. you'll see it. That's when you'll yeah. see it. And, and sometimes it'll be like an amateur guy. Well, that's yeah. what I was about to say. Yeah. Especially after the draft um, in Lowell, especially, you know, almost everyone who's there is amateur scouts who, once the draft's finished up, but before the next cycle starts, they have a couple months where they'll send them, and usually that's how they they do the uh, the short season coverage. They mm-hmm. won't send the they won't send the uh, pro scouts who have that team or right. send something else. And plus, just they, I mean, players can change so much from there. You don't really want to get a book on a guy on what he looks like in, in Lowell. I mean, for example, Mookie Betts. <laughs> I mean, we thought he was an interesting guy coming out of Lowell. We didn't think he was what he became. He was an athlete. Yeah, that's, he yeah. was a raw athlete. Exactly. So, you know, good sometimes question, it's though. best. Yeah, yeah, fine question. Definitely. Thanks for the question, Pat. And, you know, it, it, some of these, you know, I mean, I'm sure we've got listeners who are like, oh, man, guys, come on, I know all this already. You know, we, we want to make this podcast for everyone, right? We don't want this to be like advanced listeners only, you know? So, if, hey, don't think that your question is too basic to send in. Um, if you're wondering about it, you're probably not the only one wondering about it. So thanks for all those questions, guys. We appreciate it. Um, let's hit a little bit of lightning round here. Uh, we got a question from our good friend, Matthew Corey of the internet, uh, who writes for BP Boston, including in addition to a number of other websites. And, uh, Matt asks, uh, I was thinking about Ben Taylor. I'm very excited about him. Not because I think he's the next Craig Kimbrell or anything, but because it looks like he can be a legitimate big league reliever. The Red Sox don't seem to develop these guys very frequently of their current pen, including guys in the Pawtucket to Boston shuttle. It looks like the only two guys who were drafted by the Red Sox, Robbie Scott and Matt Barnes, and the rest were uh, traded for, which isn't bad, but there are costs to acquire them. Um, I would actually add Noe Ramirez is on the shuttle uh, as a guy that they drafted, but th- the fact that it's Noe Ramirez kind of proves the point. Anyway, anyway, the point of all of this, there are other guys in the organization, maybe under the radar guys, maybe not. Uh, oh, are there other guys in the organization, maybe under the radar guys, maybe not, who you could see holding down a spot in the Red Sox bullpen over the next few years? Uh, uh, Matt, thanks for the great podcasts and content. You all are the best, Matt. Um, love hearing from Matt, uh, as always. So uh, this is something we've talked about, but it, it's, you know, maybe not quite that explicitly. Um, there are a lot of bullpen guys in yeah. Pawtucket and Portland who we've yeah. talked about. Um, there's a lot of very interesting guys, and I guess maybe kind of the snapshot right now. Currently up in Boston, and actually just looking at the org page, it has to get updated with Workman going back down. But in Boston right now, the bullpen is Kimbrell, Barnes, Hembry, Scott, Joe Kelly, Ben Taylor, Fernando Abad. Um, Workman's down. And then on the DL, you've got Tyler Thornburg and Carlos, Carson Smith. I almost call him Carlos Smith. And then in Pawtucket, you've got Robbie Watt, Ross, uh, who is a major leaguer, frankly. Uh, yeah, Nora that's, Ramirez. That's a tough one. <laughs> yeah, wear it. <laughs> that's having options that just, yeah. Yeah. Um, Noah Ramirez, Kyle Martin, Chandler Shepard, Edgar Almos, the recently signed Blaine Boyer, and Eric Cordier. Uh, and then in Portland, I think is worth mentioning, 
Jamie Callahan, Austin Maddox, Luis Eastluck, Jake Kosart, Williams Harris, Ty Buttry, Josh Smith, Taylor Grover. Uh, you you get to talk about these guys all the time, Ian. So I'm going to start. I'm going to say of those guys, the guys that I would project as guys who can hold a major league bullpen job for a couple of years, okay, who are in the minors right now. How about I'll take Shepard. I'll take Callahan. And I'll take Cosart. And I will throw in for good measure from the Portland rotation, Jalen Beeks. Do you have any additions or subtractions to that group? I would not take Jay Cozart. You would not take Jay Cozart, okay? No, I do not think. I, I've i seen him a few times this year, and I'm not impressed with what I've seen. His stuff is down. I don't think he can throw strikes, frankly. Mm-hmm. And um, I think he's going to be one of these guys. I think he's actually going to be very similar to someone like Eric Cordier, who throws really, really hard, but just can't put it all together. Mm-hmm. And I'm starting to trend that way. I think he's up to 18 walks in 10 innings or something. And yeah, it's just, yeah. yeah, he's just had his issues. Um, the guy who's trending up, and it's weird to say because he's been in the system for so long, is Ty Butchery. He's up to 99 now. You know, the fastball is legit. He's missing bats for the first time in a while. And he's got a secondary pitch that works. And, um, you know, he needs to work on the control a little bit. He's still walking, I think, a little bit too many guys. But he's got 19 strikeouts in 11 innings, and, you know, that's what you want from a bullpen Mm -hmm. arm. So he's someone I think is trending in the right direction. But the other three I agree with. And Austin Maddox I would throw in there, too. I think he's a similar – you know, it's not – none of these guys have that high ceilings, but I think Mm -hmm. they could have serviceable bullpen. Yeah, I mean, the thing for me, I'll I'll just talk about Kosar. To me, I agree he's trending off of that list, but I don't want to make – granted, this isn't new for him. I mean, if you look at his 2015 – this is basically what happened. He couldn't throw a strike. Um, but last year he could, uh, at least better than he is right now. And I really don't want to let one month erase last year. Um, I get the stuffs down. I get the, you know, the control's really bad. I just need to see this for longer before I take him off of that list. And same thing for Buttry. I think, you know, he's had a good first month, but he's still walking guys. Um, the walks are still up. They're down from last year, but they're still higher than you want them to be. And the thing for me with Buttry that he's going to need to show me, and granted part of this is that I can't see him every day now, but I've seen him too many times in the past not be composed on the mound. And I think in the bullpen in particular, that's not going to play. Um, you know, I need to see him able to retain his composure when maybe he doesn't have his stuff, maybe when, you know, some hits fall in, maybe when the defense behind him makes a mistake or two. Uh, I, you know, we've mentioned the broken hand. Um, from punching the ground when he got frustrated um, while he was starting that he suffered back when he was with Greenville. And then I remember seeing him in Salem last year um, where, you know, he would just be visibly frustrated on the mound. And then all of a sudden, you know, the balls start going, you know, he stops finishing his delivery. The balls start missing high and arm side and things kind of unravel. Um, you know, the ability to not let that happen, or if it starts to happen, regaining his composure and recovering. I think that I need to see more from that, more of that from him before I can project him myself as a guy who I think will hold down a major league bullpen job. So thanks for the question, Matt. We always appreciate it. Uh, Next question from uh, David. And David says, hi guys, love the work y'all are doing at Sox Prospects, longtime listener slash reader and occasional question asker. I wanted to ask about how the Sox can unload Rusne Castillo. I realize with the luxury tax situation, there's almost no chance he gets another shot with the Sox. But what do you think the Sox would have to do to get another team interested? How much of the contract would they have to cover? And since the contract is a sunk cost anyway, why not just accept it and let him go for a bag of peanuts and as a tangent, release Alan Craig while they're at it? I get that Rusne probably has to play play his way into some value, but he can only do so much of that at AAA. Thanks to keep up the great work, David. Um, just as a bit of background, as we've mentioned here on the podcast before, if Rusne Castillo who is on the Major League roster, his salary counts toward the competitive balance tax. If he is not on the Major League roster, his salary, uh, on the 40-man roster, I should say, not even the active 25-man roster, um, his salary does not count. I would just say this, yes, he and Alan Craig are sunk costs at this point, but I would then ask, why would you just unload them for them to go to another team that may not be in the same situation? You're not going to get much for them, and then maybe they come up and are successful. 
So now you're just paying them to have another team succeed. Um, and I admittedly don't know what the um, repercussions are if you trade them and the other team adds them to the 40 man, for example, uh, what that has on the Red Sox competitive balance tax. So yeah, that's a good question. I don't know. I, I just don't. Yeah, yeah, there's no point. Like, as you said, the sunk cost thing, you kind of have to live with it at this point. And mm-hmm. there's no way they're coming up. But I mean, you won't get anything of value for them. So there's no point. And you need guys like them at AAA anyway. So you'd have to then go out and sign another player or two more players. It just mm-hmm. doesn't make sense. Yeah, and I mean, we should add, at least in Craig's situation, he has not, in fact, played his way into more value. So entering today, uh, Alan Craig uh, was hitting 204, 361, 224, um, DHing most of the time, though he started playing in the field a little bit. He's a bench player in Pawtucket right now. Uh, He's not going to play his way into more value. Frankly, I think that that door's shut, and you're just going to kind of have to live with paying him that money. There's no releasing a guy. There's no point. You're still paying them, right? So then they're just free to go to another team who doesn't have to pay them. So that's silly. Um, unless it became like a toxic situation where they were poisoning the locker room, you know, or something like that, where you just, okay, now you can't keep this guy around because he's being a bad influence in the locker room or something. Um, as for Rusne, he's actually been playing pretty well. He's hitting 301, 326, 458. With three home runs, uh, three stolen bases, no caught stealing so far. Uh, who knows, man? <laughs> who knows? We're kind of in uncharted territory with him, with this contract. I just, frankly, again, it's why would you trade him? You're not going to get sufficient value. Um, that's the problem. You know, no team is going to give up a lot of value. It's still, you know, 15 strikeouts in 21 games. K rate's down a little bit from where it's been. I mean, let's see his K rate this year. Um, using plate appearances, he's striking out in 17.4% of at bats. So that's not bad. But last year, when you called him, when he was up in Boston, he was striking out in 37% of at bats. You know, he didn't really hit that poorly in Pawtucket last year. I mean, not as well as he's hitting now, but 263, 309, 354 is okay. It's not good. Um, 20 doubles. I don't know. I just think the door is more or less shut. I see, you know, some of the writers saying, oh, maybe Rusne Castillo. I just. Unless a guy goes, unless you have two of the starting three guys go down for the year, right? I think that's the situation where maybe you see Rusne Castillo. That sound right to you? I don't think you see him at all because of the money. Like they just can't afford to take on his ten. They if they add him to the forty man roster, basically means they can't make any trades. Yeah, that's true. Because yeah, we did figure that out before a past episode. You would add you would add ten million to the cap. Versus nothing right now. So I just don't see it at all. Yeah. And again, what's the point of trading him? You're not going to get fair value. Um, It's one thing when you're unloading Clay Buckholtz and you're getting Josh Tobias, but you're getting rid of his whole contract. I think with Castillo, you would have to pay a good portion of his contract to get the likes of Josh Tobias. You'd have to pay the entire thing except for the veteran minimum, I would assume. Yeah, maybe. Maybe. Yeah. I mean, it's just, it's not happening. I don't think. But thanks for the question, David. We appreciate it. Um, our next question uh, is from Jim, and Jim says, Hi, thanks for the last podcast. Mentioning that you were trying to say guys' names more often, I'm one of those who sometimes listens while doing other things, and I missed the first mention of a name. Yes, we try to keep that in mind. Trust me, it's easier said than done, guys, but we're trying here. Um, he is one of several people who asked, Today, can I ask about Zue Lin? Is he making better contact or just being getting lucky? Uh, but just as some people move from having moderate power to having real power as they mature, could he be a guy who, through training and physical maturation, has moved from lacking enough punch to a guy who has just barely enough, given his defense and versatility? Um, so that's Jim asking that question. I should also mention we got a Twitter question about uh, Willen from uh, at Ad- A-D-O-T-H-E-O, so it's at Adotheo. Um, he asked about him on Twitter. Uh, Ian. You wrote up to Zue Lin this week. What have you seen from him in Portland? And then I have a point to make. Yeah, I, I saw him for five games or four games. I don't know how many he played out of it. And it, it looked like more of the same to me. I mean, I know he's hit, I think, three home runs this year. But it was just, you know, he's a sh- small, really small guy. He's probably 5'7", five, 5'8", five, maybe 160 pounds. There's just not a lot of strength. He has a good idea of the strike zone. Um, but... It's just he lacks strength, and it's a lot of just weak contact. You know, he just slaps kind of at the ball. And 
if he gets a fastball up, he can drive it a little bit. Mm -hmm. But for the most part, I just saw a lot of weak contact and just a tough profile given his size. Though defensively, I think he could play at a major league level. You know, he's a good shortstop. He could probably play second base, maybe even the outfield, which they've started playing him at if necessary. Mm -hmm. But it's just, yeah, I just don't think he'll be able to hit enough at the major league level. And I think what he's doing right now is more just like a small sample thing. Yep. Um, Ian, I'm very happy to report that baseball reference is back. Oh, thank God. <laughs> thank goodness. I don't um, want to live in a world without minor league B-Ref. Yes. So minor league B-Ref is back. And I know this is an exercise in artificial endpoints. I get that. Okay. I, the, to me, you can use artificial endpoints if you're not trying to make a point of like it meaning a whole lot. My point is the sample size is small. So Zue Lynn entering today. Um, I, I don't know. Do they have the previous day? Oh, no. Portland got rained out yesterday. Entering today's games, he had played in 19 games this year. In his first nine games from April the 7th through the 18th, in 31 plate appearances, he had six hits, two doubles, uh, two walks, eight strikeouts. So he was hitting 207, 258, 276 with a pretty reasonable 286 average on uh, balls in play. Okay? Pretty much what he's been, uh, probably on the worst side of what he's been. Slow starts happen. I'm not saying he's that guy. Uh, in his next 10 games, okay, so this is from April 22nd through May the 4th, in 40 plate appearances, he had 15 hits, two doubles, one triple, three home runs, five walks to six strikeouts. He was hitting uh, 455, 538, 848. And again, that 848 is his slugging. The OPS was 1.387. And Lynn had a 500 average on balls in play. Okay, I'm not saying that's all luck. You don't luck into that many home runs, but you got to look deeper. Of his three home runs, they came in a four-game span. Okay, two of those games, those games were in Reading. Reading. Oh, there you go. Reading's like 260 down the right field line. Reading has on a 2080 scale a 70 grade for home runs on the uh, park factors that Baseball Reference, or sorry, Baseball America posted recently. It is a band box. Yeah, Dylan Cousins hit like 46 home runs there last year or something. Yeah. Oh, he's Cousins, not a good hitter yeah, at yeah. all. Yes. And he's not a good hitter. Yes. Like, yes. So I'm, I was, I'm looking at Lynn's player page right now. His home run to fly ball, fly ball rate is 17.6. Past years, it was 2.7, 2.8, 2.4, 1.3. Yeah. I, I, one of those things is not like the other. Yes. He just doesn't hit the ball in the air. Like, it's just, yeah. He's yeah. This year, it's completely flipped, actually, which is interesting. Is Well, actually, let's just bring him up on uh, the Sox prospect stat Well, that's page. what I'm on right now. Yeah. His, his, gr his ground ball percentage is down from 54% to 27%. His fly ball percentage is up from 24 to 36 His pop-up percentage is way up, and his line drive percentage is up. Yeah. So, so it seems I mean, like he's kind of just trying to hit the ball in the air. Right? Which, frankly, it's not a terrible idea. I mean, he was just yeah. beating the ball into the ground before, so that's good, right? We like that. But I just, I, I need to see this happen for longer than half a month before I think much of it, is my point. That's well, all I'm also, saying. Also, we've seen guys have, like, sneaky power seasons in Portland before. Thinking back, I think uh, Cheshwan Chang is the best Chisin, example of that. Chisin Chang. Sorry, yeah, yeah, you're right. Chase Juan Lin is who I was thinking of. <laughs> right, so, right. Yeah. Uh, but he hit like something like 17 home runs with Portland, and mm -hmm. then they traded him, and he didn't. He hit like 210, and never. I don't think he ever even made it out of AAA. Right, right. And so it's like I, I'm going to need to see this for uh, the entire year before I'll believe it at least, and I probably won't believe it after that. So. Well, to me, well, I, I would believe it, but my point is that believe it in the sense that he could be a future bench utility guy. Yeah, we're not talking about like an everyday guy. Plays good does... defense at shortstop. They've they've played him at center field back on May third. Um, today he was playing short again. Um, they supposedly like him as a utility guy, but they're not playing him as a utility guy for some reason. Well, they don't have another shortstop on the roster anymore now, do they? Uh, well, I mean, they, I mean, I guess yeah. Manassas was the other shortstop. That's yeah. a good point. Um, gosh, but it's also he doesn't run that. anymore. Like, he's just, yeah. Yeah, he was supposed to be speedy, and he, he's, he's got not. one steal this year. He's like a he's like a 55 runner, but he just doesn't have good instincts or just doesn't run, and he doesn't steal that much. So it's just... Oh, Dino Lopez is up. There's just not, there's not really a carrying yeah. tool other than his defense. So. Dino yeah. Lopez came up from Salem. He's a shortstop. Ian. 
Yes, he yeah. did. Yes. So there's your other shortstop. Um, so you could play you could play Lopez there. Uh, I would like to see him move around because I think that's his path to the majors, frankly. Uh, but yeah, I just I need to see more of it from Lynn. I just I don't believe it yet. So um, yeah, that that's going to clear out our email questions. Um, we actually got we we got one more question while we were recording this from Stephen Martano, uh, who I'll I'll mention because he's emailed before. Um, but he was asking if he could get an in-depth update on Raphael Devers. So thanks for the email, Steve. We, uh, we're way ahead of you. So Yeah, there's, <laughs> we talked about it on the podcast. We talked about it on the news page. It's, it's, we like Raphael Devers. We like yeah. Raphael Devers, man. <laughs> I love me some Raffy Devers. Uh, and then I think we, as far as Twitter questions, I think we got almost all of them. Let me see here. Oh, we got a question five days ago from at Zeke Wharton. who says, is Travis Lakins a top 10 prospect now that he's showing the skills again? Uh, yes. Yes, and in fact, he is now a top ten prospect again. So yes, that <laughs> we, was easy. We moved, he is now at number seven in the system. So uh, he would have stayed one last year if he hadn't been as bad as he was. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he just he, yeah. There's a the point where you have good. to you can't just ignore stats. And granted, we yeah. dropped them down to the teens. It's not like well, but it wasn't just stats. I mean, I talked to multiple scouts who gave the stuff was down. The yeah. reports were not good. That's true. So, good point. Yeah. Um, oh, and then one last question. Uh, this one came in on Twitter, but again, guys, podcast at SoxProspects.com. Much better way to make sure we get your questions. But this one is from Dave Meehan at, D, uh, at DJ Meehan 17 uh, He says, based on current form, what midseason promotions do you foresee through the different levels, i.e. Occamy to AA? Um, so thanks for that question, Dave. Uh, for me, you know, we've, we saw some promotions – Recently. That's not what I see coming. Yeah, I don't see Akami happening. Um, do you want to go first? Or do you want me to go first? Just going through the system. Um, I'll go first. I, I think that we will see a pitching promotion that will involve Jalen Beeks going to AAA, Travis Lakins going to AA, and Mike Schwarren and Sean Anderson going to high A. Mm-hmm. I like that. Um, as part of that, I would add Matt Kent from Salem as a possibility. But uh, I have to bring up the numbers really quick here. I don't think he's having that great of a start to the year. Um, but he was in Salem all of last year. Um, yeah, I mean, he's in 31 innings, 523 ERA. But he has 29 strikeouts in 31 innings pitched. It wouldn't surprise me if there was like a bad start or two in there. So if he writes the ship, I would see him joining Lakins and going up to Portland. I've mentioned this in a podcast before. We, we got a question about this entering the season. So I guess this question is really more, do we continue to see this happening? But I interrupted. Uh, go, do you see anything else, Ian? Um, I'm just looking. No, I, no, I, I, I think that's the only one. Yeah, I, I mean, I could see some bullpen. Oh, I would also, yeah. So we've got Shuara. Oh, and bullpen Anderson arms. Up. Yeah, like Nagosek will go up. Stephen at Stephen Nagosek, point. who is in Greenville right now, he was the South Atlantic League Relief Pitcher of the Month. I think he's in Salem midseason. He should um, be in Salem already, frankly. Yeah, they, I mean, as we talked about last podcast, I think they have him in Greenville so they can work on him actually working as a closer. Yeah, I think so, too. In a true relief role. I could see him in Portland by the end of the year, frankly. Agree. I think that's aggressive, but um, other guys that could move quickly. Um, I mean, they're bullpen arms. <laughs> you know, they're fungible. Yeah, it's very fungible. I, the position players, that's about it. I mean, you could maybe, at the end of the year, we'll see something with Chavis and Dahlbeck, but I don't think we'll see it at, a, until, well, like, August. and actually, so we someone on, on the forum had mentioned, you know, get to, or actually we should say, Raphael Devers to Pawtucket, I think happens. I think August is when we see the third baseman promotion. I don't. Well, I don't. See and it. I don't think it's going to, as of right, if current form holds, as the question asks, I don't think we see a chain promotion. Um, Chavis is hitting well, but he played his first game at third base yesterday. Um, he could hit his way into a promotion at Pawtucket, but frankly, if you look at his game log, no Portland, not Pawtucket. Oh, Portland. Sorry. Um, if you look at Chavis' game log that I'm going to try to pull up here. Didn't he have like a good series or a good week? He had five good games that, because his sample size is still so small, make his numbers look better. Uh, yeah. Frankly, yeah. So if you look at his game log, he played his, his first game of the year, then sat for two weeks. He came back, and from April 17th through, let's do April the 23rd, so in those six games... He had 10 hits and 20 at-bats. He hit 500, 600, uh, 1,400. And again, that's his slugging. His OPS was 2. Uh, he hit all five of his home runs during that span. Uh, from then on, 
Oh, uh, actually, I shouldn't use that because I that included the first game of a doubleheader. Um, but okay, so if we go from the twenty third through uh, yesterday, in that span, he's hitting two fifty, three sixty two, three fifty with no home runs, four doubles. Although three of those doubles were in the last three games, so I think he got himself into kind of a funk that he's working his way out of. Chavis to Portland seems like it's a lot more likely though than Bobby Dahlbeck from Greenville to Salem. Uh, Dahlbeck had a pretty good start, but his numbers are down to 261, 358, 337 on the season. The most concerning thing to me is that Dahlbeck is striking out in more than a third of his plate appearances. That yeah, that's that's very problematic, and it's something. I mean, we high. we talked about it when we've written him up. Is and I think it's in the scouting report is that if the K percentage is what it was last year in Lowell, which was 23 percent, if it's around 25 percent, that's perfectly fine. No, that's fine. That's a lot the of swing and prob- miss, but. It's fine. The problem is when it's 35%. That's mm-hmm. a major issue. And especially with he's hitting 260 right now, and that's with a 420 Babbitt, which is going to come down. Well, and it's, it's also should be mentioned, I mean, part of the problem is he had an 0 for 19 stretch. Uh, and so, yeah, we're still in small sample size yeah. itis, but it's just the, that K percentage is too high for my liking. And um, he's someone I'm, when, when hopefully we'll make the Greenville trip this year, I'm pretty interested to see how he looks, especially mechanics-wise, and compare them with what he was doing in Portland last year to hey, see if something's changed. It should be mentioned, too, with Dahlbeck, though. His last two games, he's he's four for seven. Uh, so maybe starting to work his way out of it, but again, struck out in both games. He has struck out in every game but two that he has played this year. Yeah. I mean, if he's striking out one time a game, that's fine. The issue is when you're putting up, you know, 0 for fours with three Ks consistently. That's yeah. not what you're going to say. Dahlbeck has 2, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12 multiple strikeout <laughs> games and 25 starts this year. Yeah, that's not good. That's not good. Um, but, hey, I mean, he could work his way out of it. The point is we're not burying him. We're saying he's not going to Salem at the All-Star break. No, and I think actually I want to touch on Akami quickly since he's mentioned him specifically and why I don't think he gets promoted. One reason is they have a guy playing first base every day in Portland already in Nick Long, who they want to get consistent plate appearances to. And they have a guy in Pawtucket playing first base every day in Sam Travis. In Sam Travis, yes. And yes, you could maybe move Long into the outfield and play Akami some games at first and DH, etc. DH both, sure. That's that's doable for a month. That's doable, but... With Alchemy, last year, he did this exact same thing. He was on fire until the All-Star break, and then he really tired down the stretch. And I just, even until the All-Star break. Yeah, or just before the All-Star break. And so I just I think that they want to see him carry it for an entire season. And given he's like he's a high school guy, there's no need to rush him. You know, mm-hmm. there's there's not like a need at the big league level or anything. It's not like he's in the picture this year or even next year. So if he spends all year at Salem, it's not a problem. And maybe he'll get, like, a cup of coffee at the end of the year, um, especially if, like, Portland's in the playoffs. And so- 